Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. Um, this is my first term, my first time at IHES, but I have known about the Institute for a long time. Um, I learned mathematical physics as a graduate student from Cecile DeWitt, uh, who was on the board here for many years, and I'd like to uh, I, I would not be here without her, so uh, it's a privilege to be here. So I was asked to give a sort of general introductory talk about quantum gravity. I should start by saying that these are going to be very much personal opinions, and you shouldn't believe a word that I say. Uh, <laughs> Except for this one, which is that the answer to the question of why we don't have quantum <coughs> gravity right now is, of course, I don't know. Um, if I did, I wouldn't be here speaking. I would be in my office quantizing gravity or writing acceptance speeches. Uh, but I can say a little bit about it anyway. As far as I know, the first mention of the possible need for a quantum theory of gravity is 100 years old. Uh, in one of Einstein's very early papers, a year after the general, less than a year after the general theory of relativity, uh, he pointed out that uh, the existence of gravitational waves might imply the necessity to quantize gravity. Einstein's argument, this was before quantum mechanics as we now know it. It was years before the Schrodinger equation and the Heisenberg equations of motion. But we knew, people knew, that quantum mechanics or something like that was necessary to explain the stability of atoms, to explain why electrons didn't simply radiate away their energy and spiral into the nucleus. And so Einstein said, well, if you have gravitational radiation, the same process is going to happen, and you probably need to adjust gravity to account for this. Now, of course, this is a tiny effect. Uh, a Bohr atom would lose something like uh, one part in 10 to the 20th of its energy over the uh, age of the universe so far. But in principle, it's there. This is not exactly the kind of argument that we would use today, but it captures the basic problem that matter is quantized, and if you want to couple gravity to matter, that's not so easy if gravity is not quantized as well. So this was the start of a long journey. I once made a list of Nobel Prize winners who had worked on quantum gravity and got up to 14, I think. Um, it's been one of the most uh, productive efforts in, re in centuries in theoretical physics. From the effort to quantize gravity, we've gotten uh, gauge fixing and Fadiev Popov ghosts, which should really be Feynman to wit Fadiev Popov ghosts. We've learned how to analyze both classically and quantum mechanically uh, Hamiltonian systems with constraints. Um, we've learned the whole formalism of effective actions and effective potentials in the path integral. Uh, the Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity was basically inspired by the effort to quantize gravity. Um, we've learned a lot about classical general relativity. We've learned about black hole thermodynamics. Uh, we've uh, had some important insights into cosmology uh, from a number of different points of view. We've learned a lot about the renormalization group in quantum field theory. 
Uh, we have learned some really fancy ways to calculate amplitudes in uh, theories like quantum isn't, chromodynamics. Isn't, isn't there was a way? Pardon? Isn't there was a way? way. Okay. Wait, yeah. uh, oh, that should be a way. Yeah, sorry. <sighs> Jet lag. <laughs> uh, so slick, slick way, ways. Yeah, dropped a Y to calculate QCD amplitudes. Um, the whole idea of holography, which I think will be discussed by a couple of people, people later in this uh, conference. Mathematical methods like twister theory and arguably much of the topology that's come out of topological quantum field theory was at least inspired partly by the effort to quantize gravity. Tremendously successful program, except for one thing, it hasn't <laughs> led to a quantum theory of gravity. So, before I go on, I should probably explain what it is that I mean, at least, when I say quantum gravity in this talk. Uh, so, there are some things that I would consider requirements and then other things which I would say are likely or desirable aspects of a quantum theory of gravity, but perhaps not something that, that we need to require. So requirements, it should be a quantum theory. That is, as far as we know, a theory with something like the usual apparatus of operators and states in the Hilbert space, perhaps with modifications at some scales. For instance, if the universe has a non-zero cosmological constant, there is a cosmological horizon and there may be only a finite number of degrees of freedom. This might lead to issues about interpretation of quantum mechanics or at least about the classical limit. Perhaps other issues of interpretation around questions like the meaning of a wave function of the universe, which I'm raising now just to say that I have absolutely nothing to say about that. Uh, so it should be quantum theory. It should be gravity. So there should be some sense in which it reduces to general relativity at least to the observable aspects of general relativity in some kind of classical limit. And of course, this is less often stressed, but it should also reduce to ordinary quantum mechanics or ordinary <coughs> quantum field theory in some weak gravity limit. So those, I would say, are minima. Other possible properties the evidence for black hole thermodynamics, I think, even though there's no direct observational evidence, is strong enough that it would be perverse to expect a quantum theory of gravity to not be able to explain those properties. And most likely, in my opinion, since every other type of thermodynamics is a reflection of microscopic statistical mechanics in one way or another. I would expect a quantum theory of gravity to give a statistical mechanical picture of black hole thermodynamics. There are other kinds of universal properties of, uh, of programs attempting to quantize gravity that show up often enough that they might be pointing towards general features of whatever the final quantum theory of gravity is. For example, there are a number of indications that at very short distances, space-time behaves effectively two-dimensionally. Possibly that will be uh, an outcome of a, of a quantum theory of gravity. There are arguments for minimum lengths, again, possibly outcomes of a quantum theory of gravity. 
And then if we're lucky, it will also solve some other problems that uh, at the moment we don't know how to deal with in, in non-quantum gravity physics. Singularities in uh, classical general relativity, for instance, the question of why the cosmological constant has the value that it does, the divergences in ordinary quantum field theory. Again, these are dreams, but things that we might hope from a quantum theory of gravity. So do we really need such a thing? Um, I think that's the question we really need to start with. And I would say my personal answer is very probably, but I certainly don't have a, anything that uh, you could call a conclusive proof that gravity must be quantized. I mean, part of this, and I think this is a big part of the, it's the real reason that most people who work in this field work on quantum gravity, is from a view of the unity of physics. Everything else is quantum mechanical. It would be very bizarre if gravity didn't fit into the pattern of all of the rest of physics. But that's sort of an aesthetic argument. Uh, it's not enough to, to really show anything except, except as, a, I, as a personal choice, I guess, in some sense. Um, but there are more, uh, there are more uh, fundamental or more, more, more physically convincing arguments as well, although I would say that none of these is completely conclusive. The first is simply this question of how you couple gravity to quantum matter. If you just write down the Einstein field equations, you have an equation which on the left-hand side has classical functions, the, the Einstein tensor, and the right-hand side has a, an operator, the stress energy tensor of some set of quantum fields. And so you have to ask what an equation like that means. Now you could say, well, a function is a particular operator, so you can just write down the equation and that's what it is. Or you could treat it as an eigenvalue, eigenfunction equation and say that the wave function of the universe is an eigenfunction of the stress energy tensor whose eigenvalue is the Einstein tensor. But those are inconsistent because the components of the stress energy tensor don't all commute with each other. So in general, we should not expect uh, them to have a simultaneous uh, eigenstate. So if we don't want to quantize gravity, we have to somehow take that stress energy tensor and turn it into a function rather than an operator. The obvious way to do that is to take an expectation value there are other possibilities where you sandwich it between different states, but you need something like that. This, is, this gives you what's called semi-classical gravity, and in some ways it's much more radical than quantum gravity. It's more radical because it implies a breakdown of the, the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics. Um, if semi-classical gravity holds as a fundamental theory, then quantum mechanics becomes nonlinear because the Schrodinger equation <coughs> or the functional Schrodinger equation, if you like, that describes the wave function depends on the metric. The metric depends on the wave function. You get nonlinearities propagating through basic quantum mechanics. Now, maybe that's right. <coughs> 
Um, Penrose and others have argued that, well, yes, quantum mechanics breaks down. There are fundamental nonlinearities. But, and I'll get back to tests of this in a, in a minute, but at least we should understand that this isn't some mild, harmless choice, that this would be a really radical step. Are you going to mention that there is an experimental proof that this is not correct? I'm going to mention there are a couple of okay. experimental proofs okay. that depend on interpretations of quantum mechanics, but I'll get to those in a minute. Uh, before I get to that, there, there is another kind of uh, slightly simplistic argument, but one that I think is reasonably powerful. Uh, if you go back to the origins of the uncertainty principle, a basic part of this was a thought experiment by Heisenberg, the Heisenberg microscope the question of how you would localize a small particle, say an electron, just using light. And Heisenberg's argument was that in order to measure the position precisely enough, you would need light with a very short wavelength, just because of the properties of focusing of light. But light with a very short wavelength has a very high energy. A photon with a short wavelength hitting your electron will give it an undetermined uh, additional momentum. And from this, you can get up to factors of order one, uh, uh, an expression of the uncertainty principle. Now, of course, this isn't the, the ultimate uncertainty principle as it appears in quantum mechanics, but it was an important step towards that. You can run that argument in reverse, though. You can say that if gravitational is not quantum, then you can have gravitational waves with arbitrarily short wavelengths that also have arbitrarily low energies. And in principle, you can use those to violate the uncertainty principle. Now, there are arguments about whether that would actually be physically possible in our universe. But as far as I know, there is no demonstration that it's impossible in principle. And that's really what the issue is. Uh, a next kind of general argument for quantization of gravity comes from cosmology. Again, this is not conclusive, but we have a pretty good idea that seems to be uh, very successful of uh, why the cosmic microwave background has small fluctuations, what the correlations of those are, and why the universe has structure why we have galaxies and galaxy clusters and what the correlations of those are. And in inflationary cosmology, um, both of these come from vacuum fluctuations of a ground state um, in the early inflationary universe that get magnified by inflation and lead to these fluctuations. But this happens via gravity. Um, the argument is that the quantum fluctuations, if you have a quantum fluctuation that leads to a slight overdensity, uh, for example, that gives uh, redshift uh, photons coming out of, uh, of such an area um, lose energy. That gives a cold spot in the, the cosmic microwave background. In order for that to be true, these quantum fluctuations have to contribute to fluctuations of the gravitational field. <coughs> but if we have something like semi-classical gravity, where all that matters is the expectation value of the stress-energy tensor, that's homogeneous. 
And so that would break down, break this basic mechanism of inflation for producing structure in the universe. In addition, if you do the calculations in these inflationary models, you get a power spectrum that depends on Planck's constant and Newton's constant. So it's clear that in these models, at least, we're seeing something that is quantum gravity in some sense. And then there's one other issue along these lines, which has to do with conservation of energy. Energy in quantum theory is quite different from energy in a classical theory like general relativity. Uh, there's a difference between energy as an operator, a Hamiltonian, or as an eigenstate of an operator, and energy simply as a classical quanti quantity. And it's not really that clear if you can convert, whoop, uh, if you can convert back and forth between them, uh, what conservation of energy means. See, yeah. one thing I expected to see on your list that's not there is the argument Einstein would have made about fluctuations. So if quantized matter couples to gravity mm -hmm. and gravity is not quantized, then I think the canonical commutation relations of the matter variables wouldn't be satisfied, wouldn't be preserved in time. Um, that may be true. I'll have, I hadn't, I actually hadn't thought of that or seen that argument before. Uh, let me think about that. And along the line of your last line, uh, mm -hmm. in, in GR, if you send uh, a gravitational wave in a, in a background <coughs> field, it is converted in electromagnetic wave. Mm -hmm. So indeed this is a clear case where if you start with a classical wave you know your photons out. Right. So you yes. So at the very least that means that you need some sort of peculiar coupling of a classical field to quantum fields. So there are other indications that gravity should be quantized coming from uh, a couple of other general areas. Um, one has to do with uh, problems of measurement. Um, there are arguments that are, again, persuasive but not completely conclusive that combining ordinary quantum mechanics and classical gravity gives you fundamental limitations in the measurability of distances. The basic argument is simply that in order to uh, probe a small enough distance, you need high energy probes. If you get too much energy in a small enough area, you get a black hole, which prevents you from doing further measurements. There are arguments back and forth about thought experiments that try to get around these limits. But it's a hint that perhaps there are issues of measurement which, as in the history of quantum mechanics, may reflect back to tell us that something needs to change in classical general relativity. Then there's the, the whole set of problems around unitarity of quantum theory when you put in semi-classical or even classical black holes. If you have a classical black hole, if you have quantum field theory in a classical black hole background, the black hole will radiate Hawking radiation. And if that's all you have, that violates uh, unitarity in quantum mechanics. You can have a pure state going in and a mixed state coming out. Again, what this is saying is that if you don't have quantum gravity, you're going to have to make some changes, probably pretty fundamental changes in quantum mechanics. And then there are indications from elsewhere. Um, I mentioned before that every other kind of thermodynamics has a microscopic explanation in terms of statistical mechanics. 
Black hole thermodynamics is the thermodynamics of a purely gravitational system. And you might expect that there should be a statistical mechanical explanation. The black hole entropy, again, depends explicitly on Planck's constant and Newton's constant. So that explanation has to be, in some sense, quantum gravitational. And then there are these problems that we can hope that quantum gravity would solve that I mentioned before that are indications that, well, I guess they're indications that we should hope that gravity is quantized. Having said all that, though, I would add that in the end, this ought to be considered at least partially an experimental question. That is, none of, all of these arguments are arguments that you need something peculiar in order to couple uh, general relativity to quantum matter. But they're not necessarily conclusive arguments that what that means is just quantizing general relativity or quantizing gravity. Now, up until fairly recently, it seemed that this question was really quite far out of experimental reach. And in some ways, it still is. We're certainly not going to be able to produce gravitons in the laboratory and see if they interfere with each other. But there are a whole series of ideas out there that are getting to the point of experimental implication that probe aspects of quantum gravity. Um, there are a number of experiments underway that look at superpositions, position superpositions of massive objects that are getting close to the point that they can look at the gravitational field of a superposition of a of a mass in two different locations, using cantilevers, using oscillating membranes, uh, using interference experiments with nanoparticles. Um, there's an interesting recent idea about uh, taking superpositions of, of masses and uh, using gravity to put them in an entangled state. I have a slide on that this afternoon. Oh, you do? Okay. Good. Oh, okay. Because I have this I one. Do do oh, no, do, do you do it? You do it much better than me. Uh, I don't. No, no, I don't. No, no. Uh, we'll see. Uh, so, there are these ideas. There are a bunch of ideas of searches for nonlinearities in quantum mechanics of the type that would show up if something like semi-classical gravity is fundamentally true. There are searches in cosmology for primordial gravitational waves, which would be direct measurement of quantum fluctuations of the gravitational field. Um, and for other quantum effects that might, in some sense, be inflated by inflation to the point that they would be visible. Some models of quantum gravity give broken or deformed fundamental symmetries, uh, like Lorentz invariance, or give violations of the equivalence principle. And there are extensive laboratory and astrophysical searches for any indications of, of that kind of, uh, of behavior. There are searches for uh, the generalized possible generalizations of the uncertainty principle. There are searches for certain forms of non-locality that come out of particular models of quantum gravity. Uh, there are searches for modifications of gravity near black hole horizons that come out of certain particular approaches to quantum gravity, uh, searches for non-standard correlations of noise in interferometers that come from 
again, some particular approaches. Um, searches for the effect of fluctuations in geometry on the propagation of light, again, coming from particular approaches to quantum gravity. So yeah, I, do, we, do you have the same slide? Almost, you do it. Again. Okay, so uh, I just wanted, I'm not going to go into any detail, I just wanted to mention this as an example of the kind of experiment that's being seriously considered. So what you have here is two masses. Each one of them is placed in a superposition of different positions. And you can do that now with nanoparticles of gold or nanoparticles of diamonds uh, or little cantilevers. Uh, in this superposition, the two masses become correlated because they're at different position, relative positions. So they become correlated by a gravitational field. You can then couple the masses to spins and do an ordinary uh, interference experiment with spins to see whether the spins are entangled. Now, in ordinary quantum theory, an entanglement between a wave function here, a superposition of masses, and a wave function here can only come from the exchange of a quantum signal. So in this case, it's gravitational, so from a quantum gravitational signal. Now, so if this experiment is done, and if the result is that the effect of the masses here, that, I mean, the, the mass here correlates with spins in an interferometer. If those spins are entangled, that indicates <coughs> that the masses are entangled. That's evidence that <coughs> the gravity that caused their correlation is quantum. Now, there are some <coughs> arguments about this. You can invent peculiar sort of semi-classical theories in which you can create entanglement without gravity being quantized, but that, that seems, uh, again, it's not a conclusive argument, but it, you have to really uh, stretch. But what, what is the order of magnitude of this effect? Uh, I can't give you the numbers off the top of my head, but the claim is that within the next 10 years or so, it should be measurable. Oh, so, so, so the experiment didn't see any correlation? No, the experiment has not been done oh, yet. This is a proposal. <coughs> uh, and I mean, the trick is that, I mean, it, we're just barely at the point that we can get superpositions of macroscopic objects with gravitational fields strong enough to affect anything else. And for this to work, you need to hold those superpositions without decoherence for a couple of seconds. And so that's not yet possible. But this field has been advancing so quickly that I wouldn't be surprised if it's done in the next few years. I mean, if you look at the progress in uh, experiments in uh, interferometry of uh, heavy molecules, that seems to be going up by a factor of 10 per year and the, the mass of the molecules that they can do interference with. Uh, so better than Moore's law. Okay, so next general question um, is quantum gravity quantum general relativity? I don't know. Uh, in most of quantum field theory, there is a more or less standard quantization 
uh, procedure where you start with a classical theory, uh, you write it in Hamiltonian form, you find the Poisson brackets. Ideally what you want to do is to just change those Poisson brackets to commutators, but there are theorems that say that you can't do that for all of the Poisson brackets. So you pick out some preferred set of observables, you turn their Poisson brackets into commutators, then define the rest of the commutators algebraically from that. This gives you some operator algebra, you find some Hilbert space that, that, that those operators act on. Uh, you determine a Hamiltonian operator that gives you the time evolution and there's your quantum theory. In general relativity there's an additional complication which is that the theory is a constrained theory and so you have a choice of either solving the constraints, trying to solve the constraints before you quantize and quantizing a set of physical variables or imposing the constraints after the quantization, which is called Dirac quantization. Uh, in most theories, well in, in all theories this procedure is not unique. There are different choices of fundamental variables, there are different choices of operator orderings and so on, but usually there are kind of obvious choices and you follow the obvious choices and you get what is experimentally the right result. I should say historically that these choices were not so obvious that uh, in the early days of quantum mechanics uh, the obvious choice was to quantize with action angle variables which actually gives the wrong spectrum for the hydrogen atom. Uh, but these days we think we understand and for most theories we observationally do understand because the results agree with observation. Uh, in general relativity the choices are not so obvious that is what makes loop quantum gravity different from um, say just quantization of the metric and the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. But there are some obvious set of choices that you can make and try and see where they lead. The alternative is to say that general relativity is not fundamental, that the degrees of freedom which we interpret classically as being the, the metric or the geometry of space-time are emergent collective degrees of freedom from some underlying theory which is not obviously a theory of geometry or space-time at all. This is not so easy to do. There are a set of requirements that you have to meet which, which are actually very complicated to meet. For example, you need to get Lorentz invariance. Now there are people who will say, oh that's easy, you start with any uh, second order, uh, any hyperbolic second order equation and you look at fluctuations around that and they're Lorentz invariant. Which is true except that that gives you a different speed of light for every different excitation. So getting a single speed of light is not so easy. And with the observation, I guess, last week of gravitational waves from a binary neutron star collision, we know that the speed of gravitational waves is equal to the speed of light to an extraordinary accuracy. So that's actually a hard problem. You also need to obtain the principle of equivalence. You need to have your emergent gravitational field coupled with equal strength to everything. This one, you can hope that 
if well, if you can show that this emergent graviton is genuinely massive and is genuinely pure spin two and is genuinely Lorentz invariant with a single Lorentz invariance, then there are theorems from quantum field theory that tell you that the coupling to matter is universal. Oh, and couples to a conserved uh, source of, uh, to a conserved energy. Uh, but that's a lot of conditions you need to put in. And even if you have done that, you are still not guaranteed that it has the right self-coupling, the right coupling to its own gravitational energy, which is a necessary feature to recover the observational features of uh, classical general relativity. In order to do any of that, you need to have, first of all, a single spin, massless spin to excitation. When you start with these emergent theories, typically there's nothing that tells you that there is only going to be one candidate for your graviton. But you need to have just one. You need to somehow get rid of any others. Um, you need to have some sort of gauge invariance that eliminates any spin zero and spin one components from that, uh, from that degree of freedom and that keeps it exactly massless. And this is hard because there are pretty general arguments that there are only a couple of possible gauge invariances that can do that. There's diffeomorphism invariance, what we have in general relativity. Then there's a slight modification called transverse diffeomorphism invariance. But in either of those cases, one of the implications is that there are no local observables. And so that's tricky to get that kind of invariance if you're starting from a theory that has some notion of locality. Uh, this, is, this relates back to a theorem called the Weinberg-Witten theorem, which basically tells you that unless you have a gauge invariance like diffeomorphism invariance and the consequent non-locality, there's no consistent way of coupling gravity to matter. And then apart from this, you have this emergent theory from some degrees of freedom. If those degrees of freedom live in a space or a space-time, then you have to explain what, what determines the geometry of that space or that space-time that they live in. And you, you can no longer get away with just saying, oh, it's just flat Euclidean space. General relativity has eliminated that option. If it's flat Euclidean space, you have to explain why. That being said, there are these arguments that there are limits to uh, observability at small distances, that there are no local observables. These are hints that our picture of a continuous space-time starts to break down at small distances. So in some vague enough sense, at least, we would expect that space-time itself is, in some sense, emergent. There are some candidates for this. There, yes? I, I'm a little puzzled by the qualification here. I mean, if general relativity taught us anything, it's that space-time is, I mean, gravity is just space-time. Right. And they are identified. It's not, they're not two different things. So if you're quantizing gravity, you're quantizing space-time. If gravity's emergent, right. space-time's emergent. Ah, you, well, there are, I, I was going to say serious proposals, but I don't take them seriously, but others do, um, in which you have a fixed 
background space-time with no fundamental gravity but with some other degree, uh, degrees of freedom that become gravitons that couple with the background metric in a way that lets you build up general relativity. That's what I want to say almost certainly doesn't work. That, that's the kind of thing that I think really gets wrecked by all of the problems I talked about in the previous slide. But people do that. Uh, what can I say? Uh, it's not my fault. Uh, so, as I said, there, were, there are some serious candidates for this. There's the ADS-CFT correspondence, which we'll hear more about later. <coughs> and I assume we'll also be hearing about this idea of space-time emerging from quantum mechanical entanglement. There's also, this one I'll spend one slide on because uh, it's, because I don't think anyone else is going to talk about it. Um, there's an interesting example from what's called causal set theory, which is a theory in which the <coughs> fundamental constituents are <coughs> distinct, isolated events. Um, if you like, in, not, not in a space-time in the sense that they aren't sitting in anything, but that have causal relations with each other. And those causal relations determine a geometry, and then you do a path integral and sum over these to get some sort of an emergent geometry. And this is emergent in the sense that you can build causal sets that look like manifolds, but if you take a random causal set, it doesn't look like a manifold at all. It looks like something with uh, typically three moments of time and nothing else. And so if you want to get space-time out of this, there needs to be some dynamics that forces these non-space-time-like causal sets to go away, or at least to be suppressed, and gives you a genuine manifold-like behavior. Okay, how much time do I have? I didn't see exactly when I started. Okay, oh, that's fine. I should be done by then easily. Uh, so, next to last question, um, why don't we have a quantum theory of gravity given all of the work that's gone into this by all of these extremely smart people? The usual answer to this at a, a conference like this is that there are some fundamental conceptual issues that we don't really know how to deal with. And in some sense I think that's right. But before getting to that, I should point out that there are also some fundamental technical issues that conceivably, if we knew how to deal with them, would allow us to write down a quantum theory of gravity in which we could then say, here's the theory, let's go look at what it says about these conceptual issues. So in particular, first of all, we don't know the general classical solution to the Einstein field equations. Now that's not necessarily a killer. We don't know the general solution to the classical equations of quantum chromodynamics either. But in the other direction, if we knew the general solution, we would be able, in principle, to carry out a procedure called covariant canonical quantization basically a quantization of the space of classical solutions, <coughs> which would then give us a candidate theory in which we could go back and look at these conceptual problems and see what the theory told us. The reason that I'm mentioning this as a serious issue is that in a three-dimensional space-time, you can actually do that. 
uh, you can take the general solution, depends on a finite number of parameters, quantize the space of those parameters, write down a quantum theory of gravity, or a couple of different possible quantum theories of gravity, and then go back and say, okay, what are the, the observables? How do we reconstruct the space-time? How do we figure out this or that? And it's a framework <coughs> in which those questions all make sense and mostly have answers. Second technical issue, we don't know the renormalization group flow of general relativity treated as an ordinary quantum field theory. And this leads to the possibility of asymptotic safety. In my next slide, I'll explain this a little bit more. But a possibility that we might be able to quantize general relativity as using techniques of ordinary quantum field theory. And then the third issue worth mentioning is that there, are, there is some evidence that if we could actually write down the perturbation theory in quantum gravity treated as a quantum field theory, the sums might be finite, in which case, again, we would say this is a quantum theory of gravity. I think that one is unlikely, but there are sub-sums that can be done that look as if they shouldn't make any sense, that do come out finite. So let me say a word about asymptotic safety. Uh, <coughs> in any quantum field theory, the way that people usually look at it these days, you start with an infinite dimensional <coughs> theory space where the theory space is the space of every term that you could stick into your Lagrangian uh, that has the fundamental fields that you're starting with. Within this theory space, if you start at some point, at some particular energy, uh, and you change your energy scale or your length scale, the coupling constants flow. This is the renormalization group flow. Typically, they end up flowing outside of your theory space. They either you get singularities or you get uh, values that no longer make any physical sense. And in that case, you say that you don't really have a good physical theory here. You have an effective theory that breaks down at some scale. Now, in a renormalizable theory, what makes a theory renormalizable is that if you start with cer a certain restricted small set of, of coupling constants, you get flows that stay in that set. And so then you can say you have a theory which has a small number of parameters, you measure those, it's a good theory everywhere. Asymptotic safety is another possibility. This is the possibility that as you flow to higher energies, you, re you can reach a, a fixed point at, at uh, some very high energy, but the set of flows that flows to that fixed point is finite dimensional. In that case, you have a theory with an infinite number of coupling constants, but they're all determined by a finite number of parameters. So that's almost as good as renormalizability. It still says you only have to do a small number of measurements, and that in principle determines all of your parameters. It's possible that gravity is asymptotically safe as a quantum field theory. We don't know. We don't even really know how to check, except kind of experimentally by exploring different extensions. <coughs> but if it is, then what, that, what that's telling us is that the way we're doing perturbation theory that's giving us this infinite number of undetermined constants is wrong. There should be a better way, and maybe if we knew that, we would have a renormal or a well-behaved quantum field theory. <coughs>
Okay, conceptual issues. This is mostly boilerplate in the sense that you can find this in almost any talk about uh, why we haven't quantized gravity. But let me just go through this quickly. Uh, standard quantum field theory requires a fixed space time. You need time to do things as basic as saying that you have probabilities because you want to normalize probability at a <coughs> fixed time. Uh, if you don't know what a fixed time means, you don't know what a probability means. You need a causal structure. You need to say that two operators commute if they're at points that are separated by a space-like separation. If you don't know what a space-like separation means, you don't know what causality means. <coughs> um, you need local observables in order to carry out, out any of the standard com computations in quantum field theory. You need a Hamiltonian to describe time evolution. None of these exist in general relativity. There's no preferred time. There's this kind of bizarre result that if you do ordinary quantum field theory in a flat space time with a fixed initial time and a fixed final time, and you choose different coordinates, time coordinates in the intermediate times, you get theories that are not unitarily equivalent, depending on your choice of the intermediate times. Uh, in general relativity, the causal structure depends on the state. And there's a nice recent article <coughs> that shows that you can get Bell-like inequalities that show you that superposition, quantum superpositions of causal structures cannot be explained by any local classical hidden variables. Uh, diffeomorphism invariance, as I said, implies that there are no local observables. If you're in a space-time that doesn't have a spatial boundary, the Hamiltonian is zero, so it's unclear what time evolution means. Uh, I'm going to skip that slide, which is just a specialization of what I just said. But so there, there are these basic conceptual issues that at some point we have to deal with. So finally, where do we go from here? Again, I don't know. Uh, probably not saying this is an interesting conceptual question, let's figure out the answer. Because most of these conceptual questions have more than one possible answer and no amount of talking about them in the abstract is going to uh, let us choose between the possibilities. Not having a fixed causal structure might mean we're not using the right variables. We need variables in which the causal structure is there from the beginning. Uh, it might mean that quantum mechanics just is wrong for certain causal superpositions, that there are nonlinearities. This is Penrose's proposal. It might mean that there are hidden constraints that only show up when you look at the correct quantum superpositions. There's uh, recent work by Arkani Hamed about reformulation of perturbation theory and quantum field theories in which you get sums of a small number of things like Feynman diagrams, none of which have a good causal structure, but somehow miraculous when, miraculously when you add them up, the result does. Or it could be that there isn't a good causal structure because there isn't a good causal structure because causality is some emergent property that doesn't hold at a fundamental level. So what we do, well, there are a bunch of interesting quantization programs, most of which there are going to be talks about here, ranging from string theory and its various offshoots or loop quantum gravity and its offshoots asymptotic safety and other quantum field theory approaches, 
One thing maybe worth mentioning is that in maximal supergravity, people have been looking for a long time for the actual first divergence that would show that the theory is non-renormalizable. And so far, every time, every new calculation at a higher loop level has found unexpected cancellations that remove all of the divergences. Nobody working on that is willing to bet that the theory actually is finite, but there is as yet no evidence that it's not. Um, there are lattice approaches that try to do non-perturbative quantum gravity by directly doing uh, path integrals. There are discrete models like causal set theory, models based on non-commutative geometry. And then there are other kinds of questions you can ask. Uh, you can look at uh, simple settings like quantum black holes and like very small scale structure of space time. You can look at the cosmology of the very early universe where again things may simplify. Uh, you can look at uh, quantum gravity phenomenology and experiment. So part of the moral is that people like me are guaranteed <laughs> lifetime employment. Uh, and I think in my written abstract I said something about uh, time to let a hundred flowers blow. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. Yeah. Just a quick you started out saying um, the sine qua no of quantum gravity was quantum and gravity, etc. Yeah. In view of what you said near the end there, I'm a little surprised that you're so confident that quantum gravity should be quantum in the sense that you defined it there in your first slide. That is, you know, has the standard apparatus of quantum mechanics because you're I mean, evidently in some ways we're being there are indications that quantum gravity shouldn't have the standard apparatus of quantum mechanics. Um, I, yeah, so I am somewhat of an agnostic on that. Uh, there is the evidence for standard quantum mechanics in every place that we have looked for it is incredibly strong and the standard apparatus of quantum mechanics is really extre extremely rigid. So I think that I said in the first slide that there might that what I meant by standard quantum mechanics that I was leaving a little bit of room for modification at certain extremes. Uh, I would be delighted to, to be shown wrong about that, uh, but I just haven't seen any serious efforts to extend quantum mechanics very much that, that made sense. Yeah, just to follow up, I mean, I, I think there's growing evidence that quantum gravity will depend strongly on what boundary conditions you, you impose on your space time, where the metric is fixed and not, not fluctuating at some large distance. So quantum gravity for asymptotically flat space times might behave differently than quantum gravity for asymptotically anti de Sitter space times, which we're going to hear about later. But in a case where there's no boundary at infinity for compact uh -huh. cosmology, uh, I think that's where there's the strongest case where the usual Hamiltonian <coughs> evolution may break down. And people like you know, Hartle and Gelman have been developing some generalized quantum mechanics for quantum cosmology based on decoherent yeah. histories where you don't have standard Hamiltonians and, and states at one moment of time. So that's, I, mean, okay. I think that's a serious approach. I would, I, that's fair enough. I would count that as only marginally different from standard quantum mechanics. I think that that's taking, st mostly that that's taking standard quantum mechanics and rephrasing things rather than
really finding a fundamentally different foundation. The other thing that I would say is that that's one case where you can look at lessons from two plus one dimensional quantum gravity in which there is an interesting mild variation of standard quantum mechanics in the sense that there's a good Heisenberg picture and many different Schrodinger pictures that depend on choices of operators, <coughs> but still fits in the basic picture of some set of operators and some Hilbert space that, that they act on, and where it's just what you mean by time and time evolution depends on choices. <coughs> Uh, y yeah, uh, you have already said a lot of what I wanted to say. I mean, a, a, a lot of quantum gravity has uh, evolved, uh, uh, starting from the work of Wheeler de Witte, the Wheeler de Witte equation, uh, um, where uh, there is a standard quantum mechanics in the sense that there is a Hilbert space, so there is self joint operators, so you can write transition amplitude, you can write uh, a, a Heisenberg picture kind of evolution. But you cannot write a Schrodinger, uh, a, a unique preferred Schrodinger uh, evolution. So if by standard quantum mechanics you mean uh, that uh, there is little outside standard quantum mechanics, maybe there is, but I don't know much. Uh, but if standard quantum mechanics uh, you mean something much more restricted, which is a, a Schrodinger equation, or asymptotic flatness necessarily, uh, then, uh, uh, then yes, then there's a lot of time, that kind of stuff. I have a related question. In the causal set models that you described, you said that the, there is a possibility to obtain manifold like causal sets from, from a sort of dynamical process. So what that, does dynamic mean in that context, since okay. there is no uh, right. temporal slicing or anything yeah. like that? Yeah. So this is... One of my students and I just wrote a paper about this. This is brand new and not yet strong enough to make very strong claims. But you can define a path integral in causal set theory in which you can specify an initial slice and a final slice, although that's actually a little tricky. But I mean, what, what we can show is that in a sort of standard path integral with the discrete version of the Einstein-Hilbert action, that one <coughs> large class of the non-manifold-like causal sets gets exponentially suppressed. We have ideas about how to generalize this to the rest of the non-manifold-like causal sets, but we don't know, uh, I mean, they're, they're ideas, they're not a proof yet. But if something like that is right, then you can, well, maybe that is a case where it's something more like what Gary was saying, that you can define transition amplitudes through a, a path integral and use those to go backwards to construct uh, something like Hilbert spaces. Uh, but maybe there, if, you, if you're fundamentally doing a path integral, the, the operator and state formalism is something you build on top of that rather than something you start with. So yeah, that, there are cases where I agree with that. I would still call that not a really fundamental change to quantum mechanics in the sense that it's still sort of an ordinary path integral. But. Yeah, so I was curious about the notion of emergence you used earlier when you say that, for instance, the ADS-CFT correspondence may suggest to us that space-time is emergent. Insofar as it is an <coughs> exact duality, we, we would initially think that 
they are equally fundamental from mm -hmm. a metaphysical point of view. So, yeah. in what sense do you use emergence in that context? <coughs> well, I suspect that Gary is going to be talking about that. Uh, I would, my answer would just be that uh, in a picture like that, I have a personal preference for thinking of the CFT as fundamental. Uh, because I understand what it means. And in that sense, the picture of a local space-time, I can understand what, how to build up, a, I can understand part of how to build up a picture of a, a space-time from a CFT, uh, while I can't, I don't know how to look at the space-time by itself without the CFT beyond the classical limit. But yeah, if, if it is an exact duality and if the thing that's dual to the CFT is in some <coughs> really meaningful sense a space-time, then I agree with you that you, probably shouldn't use the word emergent there. No, so it's, it's to probe, there seems to be a sort of meta, a further metaphysical argument favoring the, the CFT side currently that that mm -hmm. is perhaps not explicit in this context. But that's, that's well, very interesting yeah. from a philosophical point of view, I guess. Yeah, I would say it's more that in the regime in which quantum gravity is important, or at least, I don't know I don't know how to understand the space-time except as the dual to the CFT. Any other questions? Oh,